Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. This is our last week of the series called Already and Not Yet. We've talked about the finished work of the cross. We've talked about the, the millennial reign or the eschatology, what's happening in the end times. We've talked about the in-between. But today I want to talk about communion. I want to talk about the language of Christianity, what communion means and kind of a little bit of history or data behind the concept of what Jesus was doing. Our key passage for this series has come out of Ephesians 1.7, which says this, In Christ, or in him, we have redemption. So we already have it. We have access. It's already done. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. This word redemption refers to the work of Christ on our behalf. He's purchased us or ransomed us, paid the price for sin with his blood, with his life. Okay, and so when we talk about communion, when we talk about the sacraments of communion, or the Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper, or the Last Supper, whatever you want to call it, we're talking about the act of Jesus giving his life for us so that we can have access to God. So as we begin, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you as we get into your word today that you would open the eyes of our understanding, enlighten us to your truth, show us things to come. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask a question. Has anybody in here ever tried to learn a new language? Try to learn a new language? Yeah, so like I married my wife 22, 3 years ago, something like that. And mi esposa es poriqua, you know. And so when we got married, we said, okay, listen, we're only going to speak Spanish in the house. Like you're going to teach me, this gringo, how to speak Spanish. And we're going to raise our kids speaking Spanish. It never happened. It never happened. I mean, like, we say some, a few words, like if we're going to go grocery shopping, we say we're going to go do the compra. If the, if the cover on our bed is messed up, we need to take it to the laundromat, we say, hey, we're going to take the cuito to the, all right, so you know what I'm saying. Bien, bien, you know what I'm saying? A little rock and pollo, penny, you know, anyway, okay, you know what I'm saying. But learning a language for me is really tough. I've tried it. Like, I've downloaded Rosetta Stone. I've downloaded Babel. I've downloaded um, Duolingo. And I can't, it's so difficult for me to learn languages, right? So, like, the moment they told me in Spanish that you had to, like, rearrange the sentence to make, you lost me. You lost me. Like, I barely made it through English class, <laughs> let alone rechange where verbs and prepositions and adjectives, like, I just can't, it's just, I'm gone. I'm lost. And so I'm in college, and, and, and part of my college degree is um, I'm, in, I'm an MDiv student, so Masters of Divinity. They're like, hey, you have the electives to take Greek and Hebrew. And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Like, I'm not interested in learning that because I know I'm going to fail. Right? I, I have a hard time learning languages. But maybe some of you, like my niece, my niece knows five languages. She will learn languages for fun. Like, it's not fun for me. It's stressful, Right? I tried to like do a little research on the Greek of the Bible, which was written in the Kone Greek, and it's a dead language. It doesn't exist because it's so difficult to learn. But I say all that to say this, that there is a language that we begin to learn when it comes to the kingdom of God or Christianity. And when I say a language, I'm not talking about religious terminology. I'm not saying that you need to learn, if someone says, hey man, how you doing? Well, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord, brother. I'm not saying that kind of stuff, right? I'm talking about a language to God. And, and when we look at the concept of communion, we're literally talking about communion or communicating with God in a language and in a lifestyle, in a set of standards and ethics that bring glory to God. Amen? And so uh, I want to quote N.T. Wright. He's a theologian, and he said this, Growing in Christian character is tied to God's kingdom project in the world. It is like learning a new language. Our natural tendencies are towards selfishness and sin. 
Has anybody ever raised a child? Anybody got kids up in here? All right, every single one of your kids, when they were like two, were selfish. Like mad selfish. No one had to teach them to be selfish. Like children do not want to share their toys. You let a kid, especially in New York, let one kid go steal another kid's toy, and they're going to get hit over the head with that toy, right? But we teach our kids to share. Because selfishness is an inherent trait to all humanity, but sharing is not. Expressing love and expressing care for others is not. Watch this. The Holy Spirit is transforming us, and as we, we grow, we re will reflect Christ and the fruit of knowing him more and more. So this is, this is part of the Christian life. There is an assumption that the longer you are a Christian you should be growing in Christian faith. The longer you are a Christian, there should be some fruit that is evident that you are a Christian. So if you've been a Christian for 30 years and you still act like the world, so to speak, or someone who's not saved, we would dare say that maybe you're not really serious about what you believe in. Right? There should be some things that happen as you grow in the Christian faith. N.T. Wright goes on to say this, so patience does not come naturally. But patience is a fruit of the Spirit and one that grows in us as we grow in Christ. Now, let me preface that by saying this. Don't ever pray for patience. Don't ever pray for patience. It's the, one of the dumbest prayers and the most dangerous prayers you can ever pray. Because the only way you know that you have patience is for people to test it. And then you find out that you ain't got it, right? But truthfully, as you grow in the faith, patience should start to manifest and you should be a little bit calmer, less angry. We must think of patience as the norm for the kingdom of God. Watch what he says here. Love does not come naturally, but we learn to love as God's love does and we grow, we learn a new language. When we have learned a new language, the language of love, the best compliment a person can receive is that you sound like a native, okay? So like, you know someone ain't from Puerto Rico if they say, oh, I'm gonna have some of that arroz con pollo. <laughs> right? There's like an accent there. They, like, okay, you technically said the words, but it wasn't arroz. Campoil, right? You didn't say you didn't say the double L, right? Yeah, yeah. You didn't roll your tongue. Ra, 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 ra. You say a ro campoyo, You're not a native, right? That, it's like you're trying to learn our language, but you still don't fit in. You're kind of an outsider. But the greatest compliment you can have as a Christian is that you are known by your love, and that that love represents the native language of heaven. Wow, how awesome is that? The native language, I gotta find out where I'm at. Um, in the already and the not yet kingdom, we are learning the language of love and we can show that love to the world and prepare ourselves when that language will be the only thing we speak. I mean, could you imagine this is no like accusation, but could you imagine if we all only spoke the language of love to others around us? That if no evil proceeded out of our mouth, but only words that were uplifting to those who were around us. That's scripture, right? The Bible tells us that. Could you imagine how life-giving our homes would be if we didn't speak to our husbands and wives, boyfriend and girlfriends, friends, in an ugly, angry, controlling manner, but we spoke with the language of love to one another. I mean, how amazing would that be, right? So in Matthew 26, 26, it's the story of the Last Supper, the Lord's table, and there's some language, there's some words and some sayings that Jesus uses within communion that are just kind of weird. They're just kind of out there, they're just kind of different, right? Let's take, this, take a look at this. In Matthew 26, 26, now as they were sitting or eating, the disciples with Jesus, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Now, you may have been in church for a while, so that doesn't seem strange, but if we were at Thanksgiving dinner, 
And I pulled out a loaf of Italian bread. And I said, yo, take eat. This is my body. <laughs> what the heck, bro? This is my left arm that I baked for you. That's just weird. What do you mean this is your body? Like, what did you do? Did you put skin cells in this? Like, I don't, yeah, I don't understand. This is my body. Take, eat, eat it. Eat all of it. And then he took a cup and we had given thanks. He said, take, drink. This is my blood. <laughs> no thanks. Right? Like, honestly, if I went to your house and said, hey, guys, just so you know, we're drinking blood with our spaghetti today. I'm like, bro, like I've eaten some weird stuff. Like I've eaten blood sausage. That's kind of weird. But I don't know about drinking blood. And so like it's a confusing language. What do you mean I'm eating your body and drinking your blood? Blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he transitions. So, so far he's speaking about right here, right now. This is my body, this is my blood, right here and right now. And then he transitions to something of the not yet. He says, I will not, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So he's saying, okay, in communion, we're celebrating the already, the life and the body and the blood of Christ that was given to us, the sacrifice for our sins so that we could be made righteous, but there is also a day, there's also going to be an experience that we will all together be in heaven again eating at the table of Christ. That has not yet occurred. So when we are partaking of communion, this is the beautiful thing about it, we are celebrating the already and the not yet. We're celebrating the whole thing in one moment in one setting. It's, it's beautiful. So Jesus came. He brought the kingdom of God to this earth. The Bible says uh, in the book of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And it goes on to say this, and the word became flesh, came to earth and dwelt among us. When the word became flesh, or Christ became Jesus and dwelt among us, he brought the kingdom of God to the earth. And what did he do? He went about preaching. And what did, I mean, if you really look, listen, man, if you really want to get down and dirty and look at everything Jesus preached, he taught very little about conduct and very little about how we treat each other. He taught mostly about his kingdom. Most of his teachings were about his kingdom and, and what that meant in this life. He, he went about teaching the kingdom and healing in the name of the kingdom and offering parables of the kingdom. But then we see one of the most decisive moments in a kingdom. And one of the most decisive moments in a kingdom, one of the biggest decisions that has to be made, is what do you do when the king dies? When a king dies, what happens to the kingdom? It gets handed over to a new king, right? Well, who is the new king that Jesus handed over the kingdom to? You and I. You and I. The book of Revelation says that we are to rule and reign in this life. The Bible tells us that we are kings and priests in this life. We are kings and priests in this life. So that means that we, that the kingdom rule has been given to us to operate and maintain in this life. And I would dare say for many churches, not this one of course, but many churches, that a lot of Christians are living a life way less than what God intended for them. Many of us are not ruling and reigning in our lives. Many Christians are just getting by. Just getting by. Just figuring it out. The joy of the Lord that we hear about that's supposed to be our strength just seems so hard to obtain sometimes. And we settle for a lesser life than what the Bible says. But when a king leaves, 
The new king is in, in leadership. The new king is the authority. He's the ruler. And that's the life that we're supposed to lead. We, we, you know, we don't understand things about the kingdom of God. Churches sing songs like, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord. Okay, do you realize that if Jesus comes, you're dead? Is that what you're asking for? Like when you sing that song, come, Lord, because the Bible says that Christ will return. And when he does, we're caught up in the clouds. We're gone. So are you asking for the end of life when you sing that song? Probably not. What you're probably asking for is the presence of the Holy Spirit. You're probably asking for a, a, a somber moment. You want to feel the presence of God. That's probably what we're saying. But we're asking the King of kings and the Lord of lords to return. Now, do you know what happens if a king leaves his kingdom to another king and goes away, but then comes back for a visit? Do you know what happens? When the king who was the original king comes back to his kingdom, guess what happens to the king who's per currently in place? He's not king while the true king is present. Because there can only be one king in a kingdom at a time. Got to understand this. So he said, come Lord Jesus. Okay, then that means your kingdom rule is done. And that he takes that place because he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Let me explain it like this. Uh, my dad founded this church in 1982. We were downtown Middletown in a storefront building. In 2005, we built this building. In 2006, we started holding services here. In 2017, he retired and I took over as the lead pastor. Now, to this day, you know, some of you have never seen my dad, you don't know my dad, you never heard him preach. But to this day, when my dad comes to visit, guess what? The man still trumps me. Right? He's the founding pastor. He, he created this ministry. He birthed this ministry. So no, no matter, it doesn't matter. When my dad walks in, dude, it's a friggin' standing ovation. Right? Because the founder has returned. He came back. And so it just is what it is. When my dad is here, my position is diminished. This is kingdom rule. And Jesus said, it, it, it is beneficial to you that I go away. By me going away, by the king going away, you can all have the position of king in this Life. It's amazing. So in, in reference to communion, the kingdom of God has already come and the broken body and the shed blood are recalled and demonstrated when we partake of communion. But the kingdom has not yet arrived to its fullness. For the kingdom arrived to its fullness, it's when we depart, Jesus returns and the world is dealt with, okay? So the Holy Communion, or a time of sacrament of communion, bears a testimony of both of those aspects. And I know I'm kind of going deep, but I want us to really understand that there's more to communion than us just opening up this little cup. And part of me hates this. Part of me hates the way that larger churches have to do communion. Right, we have tried to figure out ways that we can service everybody in a timely manner. Uh, it's easy to clean up and all that kind of stuff. But communion is much more than a cellophane-wrapped, stale piece of styrofoam and grape juice. Right? It's, mo it's more than this. When I, when I do teen camps or, or a, a, a retreat or an advance where we have time to do things a little bit differently, I like to offer communion with like six to eight ounces of grape juice and loaves of bread where people just go and tear a piece off. And we make it an hour, an hour and a half where the band is playing and nobody's really singing, nobody's leading anything, but you have a moment to hold the body of Christ and meditate upon that. And you can take a sip and you can have a conversation with God about what it means to you. And we're going to do a very abridged, small version of that today. As we get ready for communion, I want you to, in your mind, when we step into this moment, I want you to ask God two questions. And I know that I'm not going to give you enough time to really meditate on it and really 
connect with God and hear it. So this is maybe the start of a conversation that you have with God. And, and you, you, you work on this throughout the week, maybe throughout the rest of the year. And the first question I want you to ask God, and for some of you, this might be a simple answer, but I want you to ask God, do you love me? Outside of us mentally understanding that God loves humanity, does God love you by name? It's, the, it's one of the biggest revelations you'll ever have. Because some of us are like, yeah, I know God loves us. If I, if I told you, hey man, I gotta tell you bro, your wife loves you. Hey wife, I gotta tell you, your husband loves you. Yeah, I know, he's such a great guy, he's so cool. <laughs> but there's something different when you are in an intimate moment with that person or you're walking on the beach holding hands, or you're at a romantic dinner, and that person looks across the table or looks into your eyes and says, I want you to know I love you. And beyond me just deciding to love you, I want you to know I'm in love with you. Now to hear that person say it means so much more than me trying to tell you that your spouse loves you. That's the depths of asking God, do you love me? Then the second question goes even deeper. And it's this, this question most people don't ever ask God. And the question is this, and this one's going to be different for everybody. Why do you love me? Because I could write an entire book of all the reasons why he shouldn't. It's so easy for us to point out 10 things we don't like about ourselves. It's really hard to pick three things that you really do like about yourself. So when you ask God a question, why do you love me? It takes a lot of mental work to not write a story of the things that you think you're proud of about you. But to really hear a father say to his child, why he loves them differently than the other kids. I have three children and I love them all. And if you ever say, I love them all the same, you're a liar. I love all my kids differently. I love different things about my kids. Do I love them all equally? I try to, I try to. But there are different things that I love about my kids differently. And, and, and I had a moment with God, I'm gonna step down here, is that all right? I had a moment with God one year where I was taking a lot of those like personality profiles and trying to better myself and do a lot of self-help things. And I was dissatisfied with myself. I was dissatisfied with my personality. I'm driven, like I never stop. I'm, I accomplish a task and I'm, I'm on to the new task or the new project and, and I wanna find out the next thing and what God's doing next and what project can we do next. And I'm always pushing and driven and, and people would call me like a bull, like you're such a bull, you're so bullheaded. And I even had this like, this little phrase that was said to me, you're, a, you're such a bull, you're like a bull in a china shop, right? You're a bull and you go into a, a, a fancy place and you just buck and kick and you break things. And, and it was true. I'd go into business meetings and they would have worked two or three hours on an idea and I'd walk in and I'm like, this idea is stupid. We're not doing this. And they're like all deflated and they're all upset. I mean, the idea was stupid, but I didn't have to say that it was stupid, right? I'm like, you know, let's, can we work on some of these? You know, whatever. So I had a moment with God and I was just like, Lord, like just break this bull in me. Like help me to be not so bullish. And like, and man, I heard the Holy Spirit as clear as day is like, I made you to be a bull. I made you to be a bull. And so I had to kind of do some research, right? Like bulls pull a lot of weight. They plow and clear earth that not other people can clear. They move things. They, one of their main jobs is procreation, like to duplicate themselves into other people and to grow them. And he goes, but I also know, the Holy Spirit says, but I also know I need to teach you how to handle delicate situations. I made you a bull, but I want you a healthy one. Right? Not every bull has to be angry. Most people who have a bull 
attitude and a bull, uh, bull personality that are angry, it's because it's somebody trying to confine them and stop them from being that. When a bull doesn't have healthy things to conquer, they conquer the wrong things. Come on, somebody. So they need to be that, but they have to figure out how to do it in a healthy way. So for, listen, I still have to say this. For me, God telling me that he loved the bull in me, the passion and the drive and the ambition, oh my God, it like gave me the freedom to be healthier and figure out healthy ways to be that person without hurting people, without hurting them. So I don't know what it is about you. I don't know what it is about you, but if, when we take this moment to ask God, why do you love me? That is going to be unique to you and God. You're not going to hear the same thing that the person sitting next to you heard. And I also want to say this. If you don't hear anything today, that's okay. You've probably never tried this before. So keep trying. Keep going. Keep asking him. Keep coming back to it until you find that identity of love in Christ. This idea of the already and the not yet is fully exemplified when we partake of communion. The work that he's already done and the work that he has not yet done that he's going to do. So when we go to God and we pray, Lord, I thank you for all the things that you've already done in my life. I also thank you for the things that you're going to do. I'm not putting a demand on things that I want him to do. I just know because he's a good God, there's a bunch of things he still wants to do in my life and bring me from glory to glory and grace to grace. The literal meaning of the word communion is the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts or feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. This is a language. This is communication. Communication, right? Communication. In this moment of communion, we're communicating with God. This is not just a one-way activity where I'm leading you in something, we partake of something, and that goes to God. No, he wants to now commune back with us. He wants to speak back to us in these moments. So as we take an extra, a few extra minutes today, go ahead and take out that piece of bread. And I'm going to do things kind of in a little bit different order, and I'm going to challenge somebody's theology here in a minute. In Matthew 26, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave to the disciples, said, take, eat, this is my body. And for me, and f this means something different to me than it may mean to other people. Like for me, I have not always had a healthy body. I've gone through some sicknesses and diseases in my, in my life. So to me, this, this bread represents healing for my body. The Bible says, um, uh, uh, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So for someone in here today, you may need some peace. Maybe you've been dealing with anxiety, maybe you've been dealing with worry, fret, depression. Maybe you... Maybe it's hard for you to step into the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. You just need some peace. So, so the bread today for you may represent peace. For others, maybe you've gone through sickness or maybe you're dealing with sickness in your body right now. This can represent healing for you. As you hold it in your body. And, and again, this is, just, this is just a mass-produced piece of bread. In and of itself, it's nothing. It wasn't blessed by a priest. You are blessing it. And because you are partaking of it, it becomes holy. It's not holy because a Catholic priest sprinkled it with water. It's holy because the holiness of Christ that lives in you is partaking of it. That's what makes this a holy moment. But what I ask you today as we partake of this is that you would ask God, do you love me? And I know, I know some guys in here, this is kind of weird, like, ah, oh, man, I don't want to do this. Why not? Like, you're going to bank eternity and being in heaven for all eternity and talking to God. Why not start those kind of conversations today? And, and it's something different for a man when you hear another guy tell you that he's proud of you. Or your dad to tell you he's proud of you. Like, 
that means something more than someone else saying it. Let's take a moment. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for sending your son at just the right time, giving his life for us that we can have a relationship with you. God, I ask that you would hear our hearts today. We ask you this question. Father, do you love me? And we don't say this in a way that we would doubt it. But you would, would you affirm your love to our spirits this morning? Let's take a moment and listen. For some of you, you heard just a yes. For some of you, maybe you heard nothing. You're trying to make something up in your mind is what you're trying to hear. Some, some others you heard, before the foundation of the earth, I called you. I named you. I appointed you kings and priests in this life. Do I love you? more than love you. You are the apple of my eye. You are the greatest creation in the entire universe of the moon and the stars and the sun and the planets. You are the thing I'm most proud of. I dream of you. I think of you. I plan things for you. I prepare things for you. You're my everything. Yes, I love you. Father, we thank you for this body. We break it. We remember what it means to us in Jesus' name. Scripture goes on to say, in the same manner, he took a cup, and when he had blessed it, he drank it, but he said, this is my blood that has been shed for you for the remission of sin. The purpose of the remission of sin, the purpose of the breaking of his skin so that his blood would flow, was the, was the symbolism of the breaking of an old covenant and the entry of a new covenant. At the moment that Jesus died, he breathed out his last breath, there was this veil that was torn that separated the outer courts from the inner court and especially a place called the Holies of Holies. The Holies of Holies was a place that God abided, that a priest could only go in once a year to offer sacrifice unto God. And it was such a dangerous thing. So dangerous, in fact, that the priest would have bells sewn to the hem of his garment so that if the, the people working for him heard the bells stop chiming, they knew he had died because he was unworthy to be in the presence of God. And not only did he have the bells, but then he would have a rope tied around his ankle because no one else could go in and get him. So they would pull the rope and drag his dead body out. I promise you this, if any of us had to go back in time and go into that moment, we'd be dead. It'd be something like out of Indiana Jones when they open the ark and their faces melted off. It'd be something like that. I mean, this, this priest had to be so pure and, and so forgiven to enter into that moment that only one priest once a year could do it. And God said, no, I want my kids to have total access to me at all times. And so when Jesus died on the cross, that veil was torn and that separation, right, sin separated man from God, that separation was gone. And the Bible says that we can now go boldly into the throne room of grace. We don't have to go to a pastor or a priest to access God and have our sins forgiven, but we can go directly to God. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ means. That's what partake in this means. I have access to God because of the blood of Jesus. And understanding that, understanding his blood takes us into a place where we can say, but why do you love me, God? Why do you love me? Not all your kids, 
not all humanity, why do you love me? And that answer is going to be drastically different for each person. Let's take a moment. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we can come directly to you. We can sit on your lap. We can come to the throne of grace. We can be in your presence without a sense of guilt, without a sense of inferiority, but a healthy father-son, father-daughter relationship where we just love to be in each other's presence. Father, we ask you this question today. Why do you love me? Would you speak to us? Father, we thank you for speaking to our hearts and being with us here today. We take this cup. We remember what the shed blood means. We receive it with thanksgiving. Amen, amen. Hey, let, 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 me, just, let me just say, if, if that was weird to you, uh, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be weird. I'm not trying to be overtly religious. I just want to give you some experience and expressions of Spending time with God that might look a little bit different. Some of us don't take enough time to just be silent, even if it's just for a few seconds. If you're like, man, that was just too weird. This isn't the church for me. I get it. For those of you who said, man, I need some more time like that. I invite you to do that in your own personal quiet time with God. Take some time each day before you go to work. And maybe you take your bagel and your coffee. And you just kind of do communion in that same manner. Every single day, a little bit of that quiet time, a little bit silence before God. Uh, maybe do a little bit of research on something called Lectio Divina. Lectio Divina would be meditating on scripture and praying and asking God some questions. Without it being ritualistic, it's relational. I pray today that, that you were touched and impacted in a little bit different way. I wasn't trying to be too deep theologically. I just wanted to kind of give us a different expression and a different experience of what communion could be when we take some more time and focus on it in the presence of God. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I'd like to invite you into that today. And for some of you that have been in church a long time or maybe you're raised in a different church, you're like, wait a second, Pastor Mike, why didn't you get people saved before they took communion? Are they not taking damnation into their body? No, they're not taking damnation in their body. But doesn't that what the scripture says? The Bible says in a very small verse that if you take the body of Christ or the blood of Christ in an unworthy fashion, you have taken damnation into your body. For this reason, some are sick and have even died. Salvation is not the context of that entire passage. It literally starts by saying, don't you have houses to eat and homes to drink? Why are you coming to the house of God and getting full on eating the bread and getting drunk on drinking the wine? If you take the communion in an unworthy manner, you're taking damnation. Nothing about salvation. It's a bunch of pastors who take a verse out of context to control people and put them into fear so they get a bunch of hands raised. The context was not observing the importance of communion and, and getting, eating it all and getting drunk and not having any food for the poor. That's what it was about. But I would say this, in order to fully appreciate the communion experience, and this is why I kind of did it this way, I changed it last minute for service. Say, so you know what, I didn't hear God. I didn't feel God. Maybe, maybe one of the reasons is that you haven't fully surrendered your life to Christ. Maybe you haven't had the salvation experience. The Bible says that it is with the heart that man believes, but it's the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. If you believe in your heart and confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. And so now that we've experienced this communion moment, this somber uh, sacrament of, of the Lord's Supper, 
and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I'd love to invite you into the family of God today. If you're watching online, I invite you as well. And to do that, the speaking with the mouth is a prayer. It's confessing Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life and inviting him into your life to change you and to make you new. So if you're here today, you're watching online, and you'd like to pray this prayer, please join with me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark. And if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.